The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language that might not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. 1991, Section 3030B. Each inmate shall be issued A. Work shoes, one pair. B. Shower thongs, one pair. C. Sheets, two. D. Pillowcase, one. E. Towels, two. F. Blankets, two. I actually don't know what the uniforms in San Quentin are currently. Like, what, what are they? I remember it being like a khaki type of pants with a some type of khaki type of shirt, no belts, just... Khaki? <laughs> I thought it was blue. About. Yeah, I was like, what are you about? Ain't khaki? khaki? Well, I'm talking about them little, them little parachute got, pants. They got the messy jeans. Yeah. They got the messy jeans. That's jeans. That's jeans. Yeah. That's jeans. That's jeans. Bruh. That's jeans. What Bruh. is the street jeans? I love that there's three people that have three different ideas of what people wear in prison. <laughs> So, Avery, did we clear that up for you? <laughs> Not at all. Oh, my God. Come on. Seriously, Erlon, you were in prison for 20 plus years. Right, right. And our friend Lonnie Morris, who's in the studio, he did like 44 years. Right. And I've been going into San Quentin for over 10 years. And so describing what guys wear inside, honest to God, should not be this complicated. Right. And uh, the interesting thing about it, when I went off and did some research, is that I, I assumed that prison uniforms were super static. Like, I had this idea of what they were in my mind, but they've changed so much over time and over history to reflect, like, what we've thought prisons should be. Yeah, we should probably uh, let our listeners know who you are. Okay, okay. And what the heck we're doing here? Uh, my name's Avery Truffleman. I host a podcast on Radiotopia about fashion called Articles of Interest. And can I ask y'all to introduce yourselves? Sure. I'm Erlon Woods. I am the co-host of Ear Hustle. Ear Hustle brings you the stories of everyday life in prison told by those living it and post-incarceration. Damn. <laughs> well, yeah. You're good. Amazing. And I'm Nigel Poor. I'm the other co-host. And so for this episode, we are collaborating to explain what they actually wear today in prisons in the U.S. and how it got that way. I ask you to tell me where we are right now. Oh, we're at Tanya Benarkdar Gallery in New York. Yeah, Tanya represents me, yeah. I did not expect to start things off in a New York gallery. Honestly, me neither. But I really wanted to reach out to this artist, Cheryl Rowland. And so I met up with him at the fancy gallery in the meatpacking district that represents him. And we were surrounded by sculptures by Sarah Z and photographs by Uta Barth and Jillian Waring, like really big deal artists in this gallery. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got to jump in here because you're mentioning some of my art heroes here. Yeah. Like Gillian Waring. Amazing. Uta Barth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a really like avant-garde conceptual art gallery. Okay, I cannot wait to hear how you're going to tie this in to prison it, uniforms. It has to do with prison. It's, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see. Okay. So... The story starts back when Cheryl was in art school. Cheryl was in the middle of his two-year MFA program when, right in the middle of it, he disappeared. He was gone for almost a year, and none of his classmates knew where he had went or what had happened to him. It's like he had just been raptured up. And then hmm. one day, just as quickly as he left, he came back. And when he was back at school this time, it felt really different. Like he couldn't feel comfortable there the way he used to. You know, looking at the student body and their faces, I think at the time, what I have really noticed was um, safety of it, of that environment, that students possessed in their joy that I didn't have. Like the joy of just being in an environment where like you're encouraged to learn, there's new people. It was just kind of like, you know, I don't want to meet and talk to people. I don't want to share about myself. You know, it was just like the complete polar opposite of this this environment and you know it's just very obvious and I was n not necessarily jealous but just kind of seeing like man I don't feel safe I don't feel safe in the one place that made you feel really safe um, it, the last place that I had known to feel safe he couldn't tell any of the other students 
But Cheryl had gone away because he had been in jail. I was wrongfully incarcerated during my two-year program there. Served full amount of time, came back into the world, and I had the idea to return to school. So, like, showing up after being taken out of it, they had no idea. After Cheryl returned to school, he couldn't tell anyone where he had been. It was like he had this secret. My legal counsel was telling me not to tell anybody. It was tough, for, for lack of a better word, but it was, it was very tough to do that. Eventually, after that first year, Cheryl did get his record cleared. And so you can imagine it was a huge relief to not carry the secret around all the time. And he could finally tell everyone where he had disappeared to and what had happened. But Cheryl didn't want to reveal it little by little in small talk conversations. He wanted to tell everyone exactly where he had been. And he wanted to do it in a way that only an artist could. He turned it into his work. It became a performance. Cheryl decided to live under the rules and conditions he had lived under while he was in jail. So I moved as a student, but under the rules of the the jail I was housing in Washington, D.C. So those rules apply to just kind of juxtaposing both environments on top of each other. So like, what's an example? So like my art department is my housing unit and my graduate studio is like my cell. So anytime I went to the school library or the school gym, I had to report straight there. There was no uh, deviating from the path. There was no stopping to talk. So people would be like, hey, Cheryl, and you're like, uh, just be like, hey, you got to walk with me. And that inconvenience will obviously rub people the wrong way because out in the free world, it's like, why can't you stop and talk? And the most overt part of this project, the part that made Cheryl really stand out from the other art students, was that Cheryl was always wearing a bright orange jumpsuit, which attracted attention immediately. There was people who ran from me. I got, you know, cars honking at me. I mean, Cheryl wasn't surprised. He knew this would get him noticed. He knew he had to cover his bases. Before I even started this project, we spent, like, you know, having introduction meetings to campus police and patrolling regional city police for my safety, right? Like, this is what I'm about to do so people don't call the police on me. So the campus police was like, it needs to say art project. I was like, no, that ambiguity needs to be there. People have to wrestle with what they are seeing, what they are experiencing. And Cheryl knew this was powerful, that the symbol was so potent so immediately that everybody knew what this jumpsuit was supposed to mean, even though it was just a jumpsuit that happened to be orange. It wasn't even a real prison jumpsuit. The jumpsuit is not real. I got it off Amazon. Oh, it's not an actual. No, no, no. And that that was also kind of like the point that injecting it into this space caused so much of a ruckus and fear that there was nothing illegal about me wearing this orange jumpsuit. I mean, um, I asked when you bought it on Amazon, was it like prison uniform? Like, how is it sold? No, nah, it was a coverall. It came in many different colors. Anybody can buy this jumpsuit that I'm wearing. But when I wear it in this, I have to let the police know. I do believe it's it's because of the color of my skin. Why am I a threat? You know, I'm just a student like everybody else. You know, I just so happen to be wearing this this orange jumpsuit. And so everybody around him, everyone on campus, knew what Cheryl was getting at just by wearing this jumpsuit that happened to be orange. They knew this was supposed to be a prison outfit, even though... There is no such thing as a prison outfit. There's no one prison outfit. (laughs) Yeah, you don't really see orange jumpsuits at San Quentin at all. I mean, people wear them at intake, but then they get assigned to prison blues. Which are pretty much like scrubs, like you would see in a hospital. Pretty much. You know, like the the blue top and blue bottom, matching bottom. And it has like a V-neck. Okay, the funny thing is, I have seen V-necks and scoop necks. (laughs) <laughs> right. You don't get to choose, presumably. I don't ever get to choose. Maybe a crew neck scoop might be making it too fancy. <laughs> Try, maybe it's like a crew neck. But these are two pieces. They're not a jumpsuit. Exactly. Two pieces, for sure. And I've heard of places where, you know, inmates wear khaki. It depends on if it's a federal prison or a state prison, if it's a private prison. Obviously, you know, if it's a women's prison or a men's prison, there are a lot of different factors that determine what the uniform is in any given facility. But the biggest factor 
is probably just what's cheap and available from the prison catalog. Okay, well, we need 200 quantity of pants in three different size parameters. Okay, here's the cheapest option. That's like what I imagine the headspace is for the person that is ordering for their facility. That is Emily Ray Pellerin. She is a writer and a researcher. And for her thesis, she studied prison uniforms. And she was the one who showed me the Bob Barker catalog. It's like Land's End, you know? They're like shipping them out. It lands on the desk of the supervisor, flipping through it. Avery, can I hop in here with a question? Of course, Arlon. I've always wondered this. Is this guy that make the prison clothes, is this the Price is Right Bob Barker? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I looked it up, and it's not. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a different guy. (laughs) Yeah, it's a different guy named Bob Barker. But, I mean, I don't know, maybe this Barker in some circles is more famous. This is maybe the premier catalog that prison administrators, especially where I live on the East Coast, order from. Like, if you are running a prison, this has everything that you need. But anyone can go look at the Bob Barker catalog. They post the PDF on their site. Like, Emily showed it to me. Click here for the 2020 Bob Barker catalog. Yeah, look, clothing. When Emily clothing, and I looked, there were pages and pages oh, yeah, of prison clothes. Okay. Some on models, yeah. or most abstractly floating in space. And sure enough, almost everything came in orange. Or at least had an option to come in orange. So there's a, yeah, orange two-piece. Here's an orange jumpsuit. Knockoff Crocs in black and in orange. Gym clothes. Sweatshirts, sweatpants, thermal underwear. The Bob Barker catalog even sells the uniforms for the security guards and tools for the security guards. They have like combat equipment, tasers, backgammon, like fun things for the commissary. And it's like jarring from a just general consumer perspective to see this document that contains all of those items at once. Okay, so Erlon, you knew Bob Barker from being in prison, right? I mean, I didn't know Bob Barker. (laughs) Not personally? (laughs) (laughs) But everybody had Bob Barker jeans. They was like like Levi's. You know, you would see the emblem on the buttons, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, it wasn't that many jeans inside the prison. So any state jean technically was Bob Barker's. Mm, So he was getting money from a lot of people. He was making dope. (laughs) But he's not the only one that's supplying uh, uniforms to prisons. Right. So the other day I was in San Quentin, Mm -hmm. a lot of young guys hanging out. And so I just asked them who made the clothes they were wearing right then, you know? Can you look at the label on your clothes and tell me what it says? New era, mine is A four. A four. Does it say where it's it. made? China, mm, probably. China. What about in your pants? What does it say in the pants? Oh. Made in U.S. Oh, Cal PIA. Yeah. Oh, prison uh, industry pants. Okay. Can you describe what PIA is? PIA. It's called Prison Industry Authority, and they use inmate labor to make clothing, sheets. All kinds of products, mattresses, you, know, you name it. But does but does that actually mean that like some of the uniforms made by PIA could be made at least in part in San Quentin? They could if San Quentin have a garment section. You have places like I think it's CMC that makes the clothes, the T-shirts, the socks, the the blues, the the Wait, PIA system do different things. Yeah, CMC is the California Men's Colony. It's in St. Louis Obispo. Out of all the clothes that you're wearing, what is PIA and what's not PIA for you, Ryan? First, um, my pants are PIA. My shoes are Vans. My, uh, my jeans are. Not jeans, but they're the blue pants that look like jeans. They're made at PIA, USA. So if all you got is prison issue clothes, chances are you're going to be wearing a lot of PIA shit. Right. And you can totally tell PIA clothes because they have a very clear sign on them, right? They all have stamped in yellow writing down the side of their pant leg and on the back of the shirt, CDCR prisoner. Which stands for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation Prisoner, Stair Prisoner. Mm -hmm. So if somehow you manage to 
bus out of prison, you'd have a real hard time fitting into society. That's yeah. the thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, nobody wants to wear clothes with prisoner stamped on it. And I know we've talked about this on the show before, Erlon, but there are definitely guys inside who sew up their pants and change them to try to hide that big CDCR <laughs> that's written on the side of the pant. And it's against the rules, but obviously people do it anyway. Like they Definitely. patch it up? Like how do they hide it? I don't it? know exactly how they do it. I don't know if they like take two pairs of pants and sew two left legs together. I'm not Because it's sure. only on one leg. It's only on one it's leg. It's only on one leg. And I don't so, know if it's the right or the left. So you might have two left legs. <laughs> two left legs. <laughs> They're being, it's a brand. It's like a logo on the outside, which is kind of a callback to some of the earliest forms of prison uniform. And I'm talking about when prison uniforms first emerged in England in the 1800s. Those prison uniforms were stamped entirely from head to toe in this one symbol. It was firstly the symbol in the 14th century that sheep had burned on their bodies so that sheep didn't wander off uh, royal land. Literally branded like a sheep. The logo is of this very wide arrow that almost looks like an open-ended triangle, and this was stamped all over the uniforms and therefore all over the prisoners' bodies. It was called the broad arrow. So it is just exactly like it says, a broad arrow. Former dress historian and professor emerita of the Royal College of Art, Juliet Ash, is the author of Dress Behind Bars, which is sort of the definitive book on this. And really, even though it might seem a bit degrading to be branded like a sheep, these were at least new, clean clothes. The institution of uniforms was supposed to be this progressive, benevolent thing. It was better than the system that prisons had before. It was called malign neglect, which is basically you went in the clothes that you were wearing when you were convicted. Which could be literally anything. And so it could be rags. If you were an aristocrat, it could be silk garments and clothing. But prison visitors in the 18th century in England and also in America saw inmates just half naked. Therefore, the introduction of uniforms was part of a larger attempt to clean up the penitentiary system, to make prisons more sanitary, sure, but also to sort of turn prisons into well-oiled machines. It was meant to be a reform like Bentham's model prison, where conditions of prisons were meant to get better. They were more regulated and disciplined, and therefore the uniform was part of this regulation, both in America and in Britain. So in the UK, this tightened-up regulation looked like the broad arrow, and in the US, it looked like the black and white stripes, which, if you pretend you're living in the 1860s, men did not dress that way. They were not wearing these big, bold patterns. This was an unusual outfit. Both the black and white stripes and the broad arrow were, in Oscar Wilde's words, who was in Reading Prison for some time, prisoners became laughable to the outside world. They were a bit clownish looking. That was part of the punishment. And that became then part of what films used prison uniforms as laughable characters like Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin, who were often in broad arrows or black and white stripes. And so the black and white stripes lived on in American films and cartoons long after they were largely removed from the prison population. After the iconic prison uniform was abolished in the 1920s in America and Britain. Then there was types of regulatory dress control. So then there was this move that was like, okay, what if we didn't make clothes overtly humiliating and instead made them more constructive? Like, what if we connected them directly to a system of good behavior? So in the UK, the uniforms became more like military uniforms with little marks on the arm for good behavior and higher rankings. What happened in America after the black and white stripes, there was a sort of regulatory system of clothing inmates according to the crimes that they committed and also according to good or bad behavior inside. So that there was a whole color coded system. And one of the colors assigned to people who weren't following prison rules 
was bright orange. Wearing orange became identifiable with bad behaviour and criminality. And that, that's where I think the orange derived from. As far as the jumpsuit is concerned, I think it's very easy and cheap to produce. It's an all-in-one. And that all-in-one quality makes the jumpsuit unusually punishing for different groups. Like, for some religions, women aren't supposed to wear pants at all. And also, like, you have to take it all the way off to go to the bathroom. Like, you have to get completely naked. And there's the fact that wearing a jumpsuit, or really any prison uniform for that matter, automatically brands you as someone who has committed a criminal offense. And this is what led to the movement against uniforms, which is what brings us back to San Quentin and to the Black Panthers. As far as the Black Panthers were concerned, in San Quentin and Folsom prisons, they considered themselves to to be political prisoners and didn't want to be identified as criminals whatsoever in prisons. So they wanted to have political status, which would mean wearing their own clothes. So this has been a long-standing thing. Political prisoners around the world have always asserted that they should not have to wear prison uniforms. It had been going on in Ireland for a long time, over the 19th century. Irish Republicans who wanted to be free from British imperialism did not want to have to wear the branding of the crown, the broad arrow marked all over their body. They considered they should be in their own clothes during the 19th century, and that carried on into the 20th century. And then that was taken up by a lot of other organisations like the suffragettes in England in the 1920s and also Black Panthers in America. All of these groups, the Irish Republicans, the suffragists, the Black Panthers, they were like, I'm being punished for who I am and I could never possibly be reformed. They argued that as political prisoners, they should be allowed to wear their own clothes. And When they went on hunger strikes and they had peaceful sit-ins in Folsom Prison and San Quentin Prison, they were treated very roughly. And so the Panthers helped fuel an international movement around prison uniforms and led to many countries wondering if they should get rid of them. Organisations sprang up in England called PROP, the Prisoners' Union, And then in Sweden, there was CRUM, which is a reform organization. When the reforms happened in the 1970s and 80s, taking away the uniform was quite an important re-establishment of people's own identities. You two have visited prisons in other countries fairly recently, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Norway, London. London. What were they wearing there? What did their clothes look like? In England, as far as I remember, they they wore uniforms. There was there was nothing that was that different from from California. But in Norway, it went both ways. So we were in hmm. one prison, Erlon, where dudes wore uniforms, but we were in other ones where they could wear their own clothes. Yeah, so it's not a given. In many prisons, there are no uniforms at all. And a few different places have experimented with making uniforms optional, including San Quentin. Then I got to San Quentin. If you didn't want to wear no prison clothes, wasn't nobody tripping. But how would you get new clothes? You buy them. Before we got there, San Quentin was known for people wearing all their regular stuff. (laughs) Okay, well, we'll get into that. After the break, why the uniforms went away and why they came back. You know, I had heard about these times back in the day when people in prison could actually wear their own clothes. Like from their closets, like their own clothes. Yep. Yeah, it reminds me of those um, San Quentin archive photographs. Oh, yeah. yep. Remember those? Yeah. The 1970s, there's this beautiful Butterfly photograph. Cows. Yeah, of this guy in a three-piece suit holding his, his little kid that's wearing like the same outfit. Y- you can't even tell it they're in prison. This was when I was an infant. A teeny tiny? <laughs> <laughs> this was way before my time. 
But our friend Lonnie Morris was there for this era of San Quentin. Right. And you heard him at the top of the show being confused about what people actually wear in California prisons. Lonnie got to San Quentin in the late 70s, right around the time they started allowing people to have personal clothing there. Yep. And you could have had whatever clothes you wanted sent to you. So back then, your family could literally send you packages. So I could get my girl, my sister, my brother, whoever, put a package together, man, put this shirt in there, put this jacket in there, and they ship it to you. I had street shoes, everything. So, like, what would you be wearing? Well, sweaters. and You still had to have jeans, but they could be Levi's, mm-hmm. not prison jeans, mm-hmm. right? Jackets, shirts, any of that. Any color? Any color. Yeah, any Patterns. Color. You could have plaid. Any patterns. Any, it, it, there was no restrictions mm-hmm. on any of that. Erlon, I'm curious what you think of this, but to me, the idea of seeing guys inside and these colors and patterns is mind-blowing because all I think of is blue when I go in there. See a blue. I'm just thinking of seeing cats in platforms. Back <laughs> yeah, I would love that. <laughs> so why do I have a picture in my head of, like, silk and nylon butterfly collars, bell bottoms, <laughs> I mean, uh, some platforms? Boy, I mean, that was some people's move, but not So mine. you could have. If you wanted to, you could have had on, like, a three-piece suit. Well, I had a two-piece jean suit that I had tailor-made Whoa. in the prison, because they also had a tailor shop oh, in the prison okay. at the time. Black folks, we got a special accent on dressing. So among us, you always show your flavor, your style, and you know how you got it going on, as we say, by how you dress. But wait a minute, laundry had to be different then, because you wouldn't be putting your personal clothes No, they had dry cleaning. What? Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, like you went there and you dropped. Yes, your yes. Yeah. Well, no, you had no. You, so you, so you had your laundry man, right? Okay. So you had a guy that worked in the dry cleaners, and you'd pay him a fee a week, right, to do your dry cleaning. Then you had a laundry man. He'd worked oh. in the laundry. You pay him a fee a week to do your laundry. Your own, right? This was like above board. Yeah, this was all above board. Now they actually had a dry cleaner that was allowed for incarcerated people to utilize. Did it come back with one of those plastic things over? <laughs> yes, it did. Yes. If you like me, I'm a regular customer. So every Tuesday morning before breakfast. Before he go to work, hey man, had your stuff bagged up. This is what I got. You know pick, what I'm saying? He would pick it up. Yeah, he'd pick it up. Yeah, and he'd take Clean it in. You know what I'm saying? It. Yeah. Um, ever get your stuff dry cleaned at San Quentin? Nah, they don't they don't have a dry cleaning. They got this other little laundry system where they give you these laundry bags. They like net bags. You throw your stuff in there, they throw it over the tier. It goes to this big industrial something, and then it if you're lucky, it come back. But everything's <laughs> washed in the bag. In the bag. It don't come out the bag. Mm. Do, do you think that being able to wear your own clothes put you in a different state of mind? Or did oh. you just take it for granted because that's what everybody was doing? No. So most definitely wearing your own clothes made you feel like you had some ownership over your personhood. Then in the mid-80s, while those clothing reforms were still going on elsewhere, California Corrections decided it was time to tighten up the rules around what you could wear inside. We were informed that they were going to take our personal clothing and our personal property because the Department of Corrections was going in a different direction and changing the policies about what we could have in terms of personal properties, including clothing. Did you hear, like, was there buzz about it happening, or did one day they just say? Mm-hmm. No, it was a buzz. So so there had been an ongoing issue with people having too much clothes, safety concerns. So part of their logic was, well, how do we tell these guys from the volunteers? How do we tell them from an administrator and all that kind of stuff? So they use that as part of, the, part of the the justification, right? And then the other thing was the property, how much property you can have. And then the other part was we need to get people in uniformed uh, outfits, you know, that everybody would know who's who and what's what. And so we put them all in the same kind of outfits. We'll know who they are, right? So all those things started becoming a reason for we need to crack down on these guys that got way too much freedom. 1980. Inmates may possess only those items of personal clothing authorized by the warden or superintendent and as property acquired in accordance with institution procedures. So the warden had made an announcement that all personal clothing, all personal property that was not state-issued property was going to have to be sent home or they would be confiscated. And they sent a memoir to that effect. We had a 
big meeting in the North Block cafeteria, and the warden came down. His name was George Summers. We called him Big George. Three, four hundred people showed up, and the warden proceeded to tell us that it was out of his hands. This was coming down from Sacramento. He held him off as long as he could, but we're at the stage now where I got to enforce this. They were going to come around and search the cells for all the outside clothes. And we walked out to the yard, and we decided, man, we're going to protest. Our thing was, man, we ain't going nowhere till you let us keep our clothes and keep our property. So we had like a 45-minute standoff. Um, And then uh, at some point, uh, they said, hey, man, this is like your last warning kind of thing, right? And then they brought the guns and told us that, you know, if we didn't lock up, they were going to, you know, shoot us off the yard, essentially. I mean, they may not use that words, but that's what they were saying. And I started off with a few hundred people, right? <laughs> Just standing there. About 10 or 15 of us standing on the yard, and we like, well, what we going to do, man? <laughs> you know? And it just so happened that 10 or 15 were all black. You know what I'm saying? So I think that might have something to do with our affinity with our clothes and our, our, our desire to be dressed. We're willing to be dressed until the death. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but guys were really living to die. The only yard to get shot, maybe not die, get shot, though, for sure. We understood the import of being able to have something that gave you some personal identity. Finally, courts ruled. Guys in San Quentin could keep their clothes. But then? A few years later, they came up with this thing that we can't take the clothes from you, but you can't wear them anywhere. Police literally told me, you can wear your street clothes in your cell. But when you step outside that cell, you got to have CDCR clothes on. So when you had just your clothes and you could only wear them in the cell, were there any times that you just put them on to feel good? I did. I did. I did. That's crazy you asked that. I did used to do that, man. I just get dressed up in my cell. And you know what I'm saying? You ain't got no big mirror, but look at myself in the mirror and then look at me and be present around in my cell with my little outfits on. I mean, you got to do things to keep you... Uh, alive man you know your spirit alive not just your physical body but your spirit alive so a lot of that stuff was about that i think you know i loved this conversation Ron. <laughs> i could just see him in his cell like delicately prancing around a little bit no, feeling really good about himself definitely just just looking at himself in the mirror probably talking to the mirror yeah. thinking he in the club <laughs> Mm-hmm. I know, I would do the same thing. I mean, right? it's a fantasy. You got to live outside the walls. Yeah. It's a fantasy. Okay, so thinking about what Lonnie had to say, we started wondering if guys could have one outfit to wear that wasn't a uniform, what would it be? Two of our inside producers, Tony and Sadiq, took that question out to the yard. Look, there's our first victim, Vernon. So we're working on a story about clothes in prison. Clothes and so, in prison. So I want to ask you, if you could have any one outfit to wear in prison, what would it be from head to toe, all the details? I'm going to say a suit. Details, details, my man. <laughs> I'm out of my element. Let's see, gray. Gray, okay. Classic. Gray, Classic. Line, lines. Now I noticed you're wearing a 49ers necklace. Would yes. the necklace work with this outfit? The necklace works with every outfit. And can you just say your name, please? My name is Vernon Evans. Thanks, Vernon. Appreciate it. Thank you. You guys have a good day. I would have to say Louis Vuitton, everything. You know, back in the days when we used to flood, flooding is in now, so I'll show a little skin on my ankles with no socks on with some nice uh, Louis Vuitton loafers handmade from Italy. So would you have any jewelry on accessories, a hat or shades or anything? Yes, I would. Uh, more than likely, I would um, wear my trinkets that I plan on uh, uh, creating, made out of gold, uh, rose gold, or uh, platinum with diamonds, rubies, emeralds, sapphires. Y'all better not steal my idea either. <laughs> oh, man, I'd have to go with some good boots that are actually waterproof. So when I walk through the giant puddles uh-huh. from H Unit, then my feet don't get wet and they're not wet all day. Is it, is, is it any brand that you like of these clothes? Well, I might as well go with some Red Wings. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we're dreaming, let's go big, right? Yeah. Man, I've been in here for almost 25 years. Let me see. I bought some 501 Relax Fit Levi's with some uh, 
Oxford colored brown leather boots with leather laces <laughs> and uh, maybe a nice soft cotton plaid Pendleton shirt. <laughs> okay, what, what kind of shoes would you like with that? Red wing. <laughs> <laughs> Another red wing. My name is Clenard Sabron Wade, but my identity name is Akim Haru Amana. All right, uh, if you can have any outfit from head to toe in prison, what would it be? If I could have a nice floral flannel type fit with some nice open toe gold colored tan sandals and a nice uh, fedora. Can you state your name? Michael Adams. Okay, Michael Adams, if you could pick any outfit in prison that you can wear besides your blues, what would it be from head to toe? Colors, everything. Wow. That's crazy. Uh, I wouldn't have anything on my head because I think the ball thing is working for me right now. I would probably want to wear a, a vested suit, probably cream colored with a maroon tie, the slacks, and a nice pair of uh, floor shines. Floor shines, that's something I never heard of. Can you like explain what floor shines are? A floor shine is a style of shoe. It might be old school, I don't even know. But floor shine, like, like a Stacey Adam, but it's a, it's a style of shoe that kind of is a throwback to like the 40s. Yeah, that's, that's what I would do. And I'd probably have my little bling, my, my watch, and maybe a nice chain and tie pin. That, that'd be about it. Fantasy outfit and a Marnie suit. Tell us about the well, I've never actually worn an Armani suit. I used to see people going back and forth to work and, and dressed very nicely and dressed for work. And I always thought that that's what I should be doing. I want some retro Jordans. Okay. A cream color suit, a bow tie with checkers on it. Uh -huh. You know, kind of like an ice cream man, but, <laughs> but not, you know what I mean? And uh, uh, like a silk shirt with the bow tie. That's what I'm talking about. With the, with the fedora, though, with the feather. Since I'm a fashionista, I like to change three times a day. My ideal outfit would be, it'd be a romper or a jumpsuit or any type of thing like that with some nice little uh, heels, uh, if not like some cute wedges or something like that, or maybe some Doc Martin boots since I see the boys around here walking around in boots. So what changed for you personally when you couldn't have your own clothes anymore? It was devastating, man. I mean, for a guy that likes to dress, you know, I've always liked to dress, you know. And so for me to be deprived of that was really, really devastating. And so I started trying to find work around. Lonnie spent nearly 30 more years in San Quentin after those events he told us about earlier. You know, those protests around personal clothing. And in that time... The uniforms that he and other incarcerated people had to wear changed a few times. First, they were all blue. Then the prison added the names on the clothing, you know, like CDCR prisoner, written down the pants leg and on the back of your shirts. I vowed that I would never wear state issue clothing with the CDCR on it. And, and I was able to basically keep that up for most of my time in prison. Like Lunny had a gang of button down shirts yeah. that probably was like on their last thread. Yep. I wore them to the <laughs> like, last like, yeah, yeah, like like I they were just the... just uh, due to attrition. Yeah. They were see through. They was like yeah. silk. Yeah, no, I'm telling you. Know? Yeah. And the E line, yeah. I was like, man, I'm I'm not wearing that C D C R stuff on me. So Lunny held on to the clothes he had. And he also had another tool, the intense sport of prison hand me downs. And then guys going home, you got to catch some homeboys going home. Let me see that shirt, bro. Oh, they ain't got no CD shirt. Oh, let me have that, bro. I used to track dudes. You going home, bro. Remember that jacket, that jacket you got? Let me have that. That shirt you got that long sleeve, I buy that. You know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 But for sure, <laughs> if you one of those dudes in prison that has, like, button downs yeah. and jeans, when you're going home or you're on your way out, people are at you. Like, bro, what you doing with that shirt? Bro, they was at me. What you doing, yeah, what you doing, with, them, what you doing with them jeans? What you doing yeah. with them boots? What you doing? Then in 2021, Lonnie wound up on the receiving end of that kind of attention because after 43 years, he was finally going to be released from prison. Dudes are really clocking when you getting out. And then they're trying to sway you against giving the clothes that you promised to somebody to give to them. But I'm your own boy. You just met that dude in here and all that kind of I went through all that jacket. Oh, my Lord. Oh, they was at me about that jacket. 
The jacket. Legendary. Mm-hmm. It was the only jacket I ever saw him in. Yeah. Held on to that thing. Am I remembering correctly that your jean jacket had plaid inside of it? The inlining? Yes. Yeah. Inlining, now yeah. that yeah. had to be... But that was personal. Personal? Yeah, it was personal. Yeah, that was, that was, that was a dicky. That was a dicky. Oh, okay. So that it had to be pretty old. Y- yeah, it was a little old, yeah. Mm. But again, because of that that that, that law, it was... It, the grandfather rule? Yeah, the grandfather rule. Because of that, then they couldn't take my dicky. That's got to be the title. <laughs> You couldn't get no more dickies. No, I can't. Don't take my dickies. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Lamo handed him down. We can't say to who, but he handed him down. That's right. Yeah, I, guess, I remember there was a there was a passionate struggle to get that. But Lonnie left that signature jacket behind, and I'm guessing other stuff that reminded him of life inside. When I got out of prison. I, I initially had vowed when I got proud I was never gonna wear jeans again. Never wear no blue jeans again in my life, right? Uh, and then I, I didn't wear them for a year. I wanted all the fly colors, man. Give me a variety of colors, and blue was not one of them. So that emotional journey that Lonnie went on with his jeans is sort of the parallel opposite of what happened to Cheryl, the artist. He knew he wanted to wear this orange jumpsuit as a statement. But, like, he didn't want to actually feel that material on his skin again, you know? That's really why he bought his prison uniform on Amazon rather than, say, the Bob Barker catalog. And, like, comparatively, the jumpsuit that Cheryl wore for his art piece was, like, luxurious. The one on Amazon was amazing. It had buttons. It had a zipper. Not only a zipper, it had a two-way zipper, which is highly functional and great. So you don't have to remove the entire coverall when you use the rest. You know what I mean? Like, it was just so nice. Like, if I do have to do this, at least I'm going to be comfortable doing it, you know? Although it's not like Cheryl was actually emotionally comfortable wearing this jumpsuit. Doing it for me was also personally hard. Even though the jumpsuit wasn't real, it was torturous to put on this garment that, like, daily reminders of the space that I just exited. Like, why am I doing this? You know? It got tough. I mean, it got really tough. And wearing it every day became activism in a way for me to illuminate, like, every work day I'm here on campus wearing this somebody's going to trial somebody's going to court but more bodies like me are getting in these cages and places but it's also just so fascinating to subvert the meaning to take this uniform and become the one who's like unique and standing out yeah exactly and I you know by all means I I wish anybody had that freedom to just be themselves and wear whatever they wanted to wear it (laughs) I want the freedom to wear it wear many things uh, without being scrutinized or being feared, even though I'm not a threat. And that inability to wear whatever he wanted, both inside and outside jail, was made very clear to Cheryl during a trip to New York where he presented the jumpsuit at an arts conference. I brought it in my backpack, changed in the restroom, came out, presented my project, went back to the restroom, changed out of it, put in my backpack and left. And after leaving, I went out to the streets of New York and I saw this young young lady. She, she was white and she had on the exact same jumpsuit. And I asked her, I was like, I know where you got that jumpsuit. I know the brand. I can't believe you're wearing this. And I was like, why are you wearing it? She was like, oh, I just got out. Like, you know, with a smile and a playful joke. And I was like, wow, this is so the opposite of all the things that I feel. Like, you don't know what I just had to do to even wear this. And you're out here in New York streets just, like, breezing through town in this thing. Like, man, I would never. So in his own life, when he's not performing with his jumpsuit, Cheryl is really not one to have a uniform But I'm also an artist. I don't know. Some people may be cool with wearing the same thing. But for me, I like a little bit of spice and variety. But sometimes, as an artist, that's not the best for your clothes. Because some of my favorite sweatshirt, track suits or whatever, top and bottom, they have like resin on it, like things you can't wash out. Cheryl says a lot of his artist friends have jumpsuits that they wear in the studio so they can get paint and resin all over their clothes. Something like a uniform. 
it dawned on me the other day. I was like, you know, I I don't have one. I don't have an article of clothing that I just kind of go to work in and it's terrible. And I'm like, oh, wow, like I need to get it together. And maybe I do need a uniform. And Cheryl's considering it. He'd maybe even wear a jumpsuit, but definitely not an orange one. Like Lonnie said about jeans, it takes a while to unpair the clothes from the memories associated with them. About a year after I'd been out of close to it, um, the practical side started coming up, right? You know, you just can't be dressed up all the practical, time, every yeah. day. Uh, you can, but costs, right? And, and not only that, it's just not comfortable all the time. And so I started thinking about the jeans thing, and I was like, man, you know what? If I refuse to get jeans, that means the lingering influence or impact of the prison is still controlling, dictating how I'm living my life as a free person. So I'm not going to do that. And, and jeans feel good, you know? So I bought me a pair of jeans, right? What was it like the first time you put the jeans on? You know what? It wasn't like I thought it was going to be. I thought, you know, I thought I was going to have some kind of visceral reaction to it, but I didn't. It felt, yeah. They felt comfortable. And the first thing was, you know, with me, it's always do they fit good, do they look good, right? And they, the ones I got, the first pair I got, fitted good and they looked good. May I ask, Erlon, Nigel, what mm-hmm. do you two wear when you go inside? Like well, you, you know, yeah. What do you wear when you go into prison? Well, when I go in there, I dress up. I mean, I go up in that motherfucker on point. <laughs> yeah, truly, you do. I probably be like too in flamboyant. what? Like what? I, I'd probably be in there with what Louis shoes on. You always have the no slacks. Way. But I see those yeah, a lot. Slacks. And then I might even mix it up with some gang attire, but nobody know because I got on Louis shoes. But you're always color coordinated, <laughs> right? Oh, always color coordinated. From that's, hat that's, to socks. That's me. That's what do you wear, Nigel? Um, well, I actually she wear color this. color coordinates, too. <laughs> I coordinate, too, but in a different way. Because I actually wear the same outfit every time I go in. Huh. I wear, yeah, I wear black jeans, a t-shirt, and a black button-up over that, and a pair of black sneakers. That Okay, I've seen you in the world before. That is extremely sedate. For, <laughs> Nigel has very in, incredible style and is, well, like, very you. fearless. This, this low-key, Nigel. Clothes. This is her on the low. This is this is low key me, and it is very intentional. Because when I go into prison, really, what I want to say with the way that I look is that you can always count on me. I am always going to be the same person. I will always have the same outfit on. So my uniform says I'm always going to show up, and I'm always going to show up as the same person. But that, like, what are airlines' outfits saying? Because like you're saying something else too, right? Oh, I'm saying uh, just keep doing right, and you will be wearing this in a minute. Because when I go in there, that's that's what I try to do. You know, I know that it's an inspiration for others. Yeah, I try my best to be an inspiration. Yeah, to I mean, I see how people light up. Oh, yeah. When, when they see you walk into your yard. It's, yeah. it's really, it's beautiful. They, 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 they put themselves in my clothes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you're both sort of representing the two different approaches, you know, like the pros and cons of having a uniform versus not having a uniform. And you're both saying really distinct things things with your with your clothes you're both projecting real messages with your clothes Mm -hmm. which is i mean arguably it's what we all sort of do in our daily life it's just really really fine-tuned no i i would say that um we both have the freedom to choose what we want our clothes to say when we go into prison and that's the big difference that we are making a choice um yeah through our selection well I don't know. I think I wore the regular uniform too long to just not just be stand out and just not to stand out. (laughs) I did totally get that. Yeah. This special combination episode of Articles of Interest and Ear Hustle was produced by me, Avery Truffleman. With me, Nigel Poor, Erlon Woods, Bruce Wallace, and Amy Standen. With help from Rasan New York Thomas, Neroli Price, and Tony Tafoya and Darrell Sadiq Davis inside San Quentin. This episode was sound designed and engineered by me, Erlon Woods, and Avery Truffleman, with help from Fernando Arruda. It features music by David Jossi, Antoine Williams, Erlon Woods, and Darrell Sadiq Davis, and Ray Royal. Amy Standin edits the show. Shubnam Sigmund is Ear Hustle's managing producer. And Bruce Wallace is the executive producer. Thanks to acting warden Oak Smith. 
Thanks also to Olivia Melkonian, Anna Sinfield, Ms. Joaquin Nalevu, and most of all, Claire Mullen. And as you know, every episode of Ear Hustle has to be approved by this woman here. I am Lieutenant Giamare Berry, the Public Information Officer here at San Quentin State Prison, and I approve this episode. This episode was made possible by the Jess Trust, working to amplify voices, vision, and power of communities that are transforming the justice system. And this is y'all's last episode of the season, right? Yes, it yes, is. It Congratulations. Is. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Episode what? 92. Whoa. <laughs> How many seasons? 11 seasons. 11 seasons going on season 12. Damn. For listeners, we will be dropping a couple bonus episodes between seasons, so please keep your ears open for that. Yep. And I really want to give some special thanks Mm -hmm. to our new friend at the California Institution for Women, um, Lieutenant Newborg, who's the public information officer there. He was really helpful this season getting us into the prison, and we're looking forward to working with you next season. Definitely. We'll be back on September 6th with season 12. Wow. tell Mm. me this. What season are you on, Avery? (laughs) I mean, like, technically season four, but I'm a one-man band, you guys. Like, seasons is way too fancy for me. (laughs) All the time. (laughs) Okay, well, regardless of seasons or amount of episodes, listeners, if you aren't already listening to and loving articles of interest, you absolutely must check out Avery's show. It's delightful, and you learn so much. And while you're at it, check out her newsletter, articlesofinterest.substack.com. And to all the Articles listeners out there, you must check out Ear Hustle. It's an extraordinary show, and I've been listening to them from the very beginning. And they also have a newsletter. It's called The Lowdown, and you can subscribe at earhustlesq.com slash newsletter. Ear Hustle is on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at earhustlesq. Ear Hustle and Articles of Interest are both proud members of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, creator-owned, listener-supported podcasts. Discover audio with vision at radiotopia.fm. I'm Erlon Woods. I'm Nigel Poor. And I'm Avery Truffleman. Okay, three, <gasps> okay, two, two, one. one. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. Remember this? Mm. I am a man of yeah. Southern comfort. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my brother with me. <laughs> That's that I movie like you that just movie. said. Yeah, I know. I like that movie. My brother, where I thought that was a good movie. Yeah. Radio Tokyo. From P.